Shalom, giving all praises and all glory unto Yahweh by Hashem Yahweh Shai, by Hashem Rachodash, double honors to the elders and apostles of Great Millstone that rule well. And Shalom to Yahkim, a teaching this word around the globe with faith and truth and in sincerity. As always, I'd like to start by saying this is the Baba Kaleb from the GMS London Forecasters Camp coming back at even another lesson to edify the Lord's elect. As always, um, as I said, I start by saying we are the real Hebrew Israelites. The real Israelites, these are called Negroes, Latinos, Hispanics, Native Americans, West Indians, West Africans predominantly. However, you are going to get Israelites that do look like the other nations because Israel as a people has been scattered amongst all nations, start of various captivities. But if your seed line by your forefathers goes back to the man in the Bible named Israel, then you too are an Israelite no matter what you may look like. Because the book of Numbers chapter 1 and verse 18 states, that your nationality is determined by the lineage of your forefathers. Okay? So, I was out and about today, and as I was walking, I came across this um, bit of the pavement where they've done some kind of um, artistic uh, display where they've got the rocks in this formation. And there was a bit of pavement which was normally paved, you know, just regular paving stones that was flat and smooth and everything like that. And as I was walking along, something in the spirit said to me, you know what? Go along the crooked path. Go along the, the, the path that's not so smooth and easy. So as I was walking across these stones, I was thinking, that, you know, this is kind of like a metaphor for, for one's walking this truth in the sense that there's going to be times of great difficulty and, and adversity and you, you continue along this path in spite of that adversity. And that's what I was thinking as I was walking across these crooked paving stones. And there was a point when I went to step on one and I, <laughs> it was a little higher than the one before it and I kicked it and I could have tripped. But you know what? I didn't trip because I was able to stay with myself. And I thought, you know what, man? This is actually quite spiritual what I'm doing. Let me see if I can make an edifying lesson out of it. So I decided to take a photograph of this. And um, yeah, just to speak on it, I mean, I, I can speak of my own personal testimony of this walk in this faith it's never been easy it's never been easy and it's never supposed to be easy see there's a saying you know if it was easy everybody would do it you know and if you want a comfort and you know not to have to expend any effort or thought then this truth isn't going to be for you because this truth is going to try you this truth is designed to try you, it's designed to try all of us to see what manner of pe men we actually are. Because not just any man can be of the elect. First of all, you have to be called. Secondly, you have to be chosen. Thirdly, you have to endure. I suppose those are the three, three points I'm going to hit on. You know, being called. Okay, you heard this word, cool. What do you do with it? Being chosen, well, nobody can, nobody knows if they're chosen. That's why we say we're of the hopeful elect. Because if we did know we were chosen, we'd be able to sit back on our asses and be like, you know what, man? I was already predestined for salvation from the foundation of the earth. I don't need to, I don't need to lift a finger. So therefore, I'm just going to wait for your I to come back and I'll be automatically given my crown and my position in the kingdom. But what fun would that be? Let's be honest. I mean, if we, if we actually knew, okay, yeah, I'm of the elect and... I'm going to be in the kingdom, then there would be no drama. Let's look up that word drama. And <laughs> the Most High wants drama because this is his story. This is how he's ordained it to be. Let's look up what this word means, drama. There we go. Drama, composition in prose or verse, pertaining in dialogue or pantomime, a story involving conflict or contrast of character. Let me read that again. Composition in prose or verse, presenting in dialogue or pantomime, a story involving conflict or contrast of character, especially one intended to be acted on in the stage in a play. Now, this is the interesting thing. We are all actors in Yahweh's play. In the sense that the whole world is a stage, as Shakespeare said. 
But it's true because the whole world is a stage and we are playing out the play by the ultimate playwright, Yahweh himself. He ordained how the story would go for all of us. Even Yahweh Shai himself, when he was on the earth, he had to play out his role and his lot as it was ordained in the scriptures to be played out by him. You see, Yahweh Shai said to himself, I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. I must be about my father's business. Let me just bring out those precepts. Luke 2 and 49 is a scripture I'm looking for. Bear with me. This is when Yahashua was 12 years old. Right, Luke 2 49. Yeah, here we go. I'm going to start from verse 40, Luke 2 and 40. And the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of the Most High was upon him. Now his parents, speaking of Mary and Joseph, went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Yahashai tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew it not of it. But they, supposing to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in a temple, sitting there in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Now what you've got to understand is three days this child was missing. Yahusha was missing three days. So you can only imagine what his mother Mary and Joseph were going through because you you have any parent who loses their child even for an hour, they're going to be distraught, especially the mother. But yet Yahusha was lost three days. Yeah. So that it says, and when they found him, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So Yahashua was breaking down the scriptures even at the age of 12. Sitting amongst elders, you know, breaking down scriptures and precepts. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Why hast thou dealt thus with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Yeah, you see? So it means that they were sorrowful looking for him. And he said, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? So at age 12, a young boy becomes a man. You know, and in this society at 12, a lot of children are still filled with folly and foolishness. A lot of children don't think that they become an, an adult until the age 18. Or maybe the age 21. But realistically a man becomes a, a boy turns into a man at age 12. Now at age 12. Yahusha was able to be sitting there. With elders breaking down scriptures. That's because the wisdom was given unto him. But. Do you think it was easy for him to do that? No. Because he's still under the roof of his. Mother and his father. Hence why. When he went off to do his own thing as a young man. They were like, why is it that, why have you dealt without, why has thou dealt with us thus? But he had to turn around and say, look, you know, wist you not that I must be about my father's business? Meaning that Yahashai knew the path he had to walk, even at the age of 12. And he knew he had to be about his father's business, because Yahashai's walk was not an easy walk. You know, um, the scriptures say that he was a man acquainted with sorrows. 
with grief and sorrows. Yet here you have the second most powerful being in all of creation, be it is acquainted with grief and sorrow. Yahweh had a diff very difficult path and met a very bitter end in the crucifixion at Golgotha. But was Yahweh able to turn around and say, look, you know what? Instead of walking down this path that the Yahweh, my father, has ordained for me, I have to go across this this dangerous path, you know, with, uns well, he, he knew of a certainty what would his, his fate would be, but he had to bear that cross. And we too have to go down that same dangerous path. Now, not all of us are going to be martyrs, although some of us will be. But even if you're not a part martyr, you're not going to have an easy walk in this truth. And we go through some of the things that, that you might be, um, that might afflict you. I mean, many brothers in this faith have different health conditions, adverse health conditions. I myself have my own adverse health condition. Many brothers have got, you know, pain in their back, pain in their hips, pain in their knees. Some brothers have insomnia. You know, some people have um, all kinds of different issues that they have to deal with in the flesh while still maintaining their faith and being in his truth. Now, this is an interesting thing because we shouldn't look at our our weaknesses as, um, yeah, it can be like a thorn in the flesh and it can be annoying at times, but at the same time, our adversities also help to keep us humble. I mean, in my case, I know it definitely has humbled me, the condition that I have to deal with personally, because I can't do the things I used to do when I was a young man. You know, um, my my uh, my mind can't handle things like that. Like you know, I used to be able to do things, study hard for hours. You know, because I was quite a studious guy. I still am quite a studious guy, but like, I I don't have the the capacity to do the things at the level I used to be able to do when I was younger. And that in itself is humbling because it means that you know, when you are going through your afflictions and your adversities, it brings you closer to Yahweh while Yahweh shy. Because then when you're in your afflictions, that's when your heart is sorrowful and that's when your heart is repentant and that's when you're, you're, you're desiring redemption and salvation all the more. Because let's put it this way, if this was like, if this life was like a fairground and we were having a time of our lives like, um, what's that song from Dirty Dancing? I've had the time of my life. That one, who is it? Is it Jennifer Garner and whoever sings it? I can't remember. But you know that song, that famous song, Time of Our Lives. If we were having our t the time of our lives on this earth, our minds wouldn't be on this truth. Our minds wouldn't be on Yahweh Shai's sacrifice. Our minds wouldn't be on Yahweh Shai's return and our salvation because we'd be happy here. We'd be content here. So really, it's a good thing to, to have adversity in the flesh because it makes you want to get up out of this place. And also it makes you hate this place all the more. Hating this place, I'd say, is a vital component for staying in this truth. Because if you hate this place, you want to see this place get destroyed. And that's going to be what your mind is meditating on. The scripture says in 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, No man at war if entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him that have called him to be a soldier. Let me see if it is 2 Timothy 2 and 4. It might not be, but that scripture just jumped into my mind. Yes, it is two and four. For why do you have by Shimei Shai? Right in point. Second Timothy two verse four. No man that warreth, and we are at war. We are engaged in a spiritual war that takes place twenty four seven. The reason why I say the spiritual war takes place 24-7 is because when you're awake, there's going to be demons attacking your mind. Even when you're asleep, <laughs> let me put it this way, even in the moments when you're in your bed, before you sleep, demons can jump on you and be attacking you then. Even when you're sleeping, demons can be attacking your mind, giving you weird-ass dreams or, you know, some dreams. <laughs> when, when you're discerning dreams, you know, Many dreams can show you different things about yourself. You know, like, um, I'll put a personal testimony out there. There was a time when I had this dream and it, and it shocked me what I saw in this dream. 
There used to be a girl that I used to find very attractive, well, still do find very attractive. Lord willing, I have her as a concubine in the kingdom, you know, Lord willing. But the fact of the matter is that I had this weird ass dream where I saw this, this, this girl in a position that I didn't really want to see her in. And she was being, um, <laughs> this is going to sound very, very, very weird, but she was being, um, she's basically having sex with a demon. And, um, I remember seeing it thinking, I don't like the look of that. And then it showed me something about myself. What did it show me about myself? That I had, that I had lust in my flesh towards this woman. And it made me check myself. So therefore the demon, well, the spirit of the Most High put that dream on me to make me realize, hang on a minute, you need to check yourself because you don't want to be, you don't want to be um, giving in to, to, to your lust or your temptations and going off. So that dream was a warning sign and it was a real wake up, a real wake up call. I have many dreams of um, of different things and, and uh, all very spiritual, but I'm not going to go into, the, into them too deep now. But I'm just saying that to say the fact that that you're you're at war all the time. You're at spiritual war all the time. From the minute you wake up, from the minute you set foot out your front door, you've got all kinds of way with demons in the street. You know, you go to your workplace, there's demons there. You might go to, if you're at school, you go to school, there's full of demons there. I mean, have you ever walked past a, a school at night? Me, even when I was in the world, when I used to, when I used to walk past schools at night time, I used to feel airy because I just used to think there's so many foul spirits up in them school buildings just festering there from the children coming in there day after day. I mean, when the children are going to school and they're doing all this wickedness, do you not think it's demons playing on their mind to make them do it, do the wickedness? You know, like, let's say you're at secondary school and you've got these kids smoking behind the bike shed or, you know, <laughs> running off and, and having sex in the toilets with other, other students and you know, all kind of madness, you know, having, um, what do you call it, uh, violent spirits on them, making them want to bully other kids or steal their lunch money and be violent to other people. What you you got to look at the spiritual side of everything, man. So, yeah, man, I remember when I used to walk past schools at night time, particularly my secondary school, boy, that's just an airy vibe about it. I absolutely hate that place where I went to school. Um, <laughs> all the places I went to school, I hate. Be it, be it school, college, university, I hate them all. But nothing's more airy than walking past my old secondary school at night time, man. It's just airy, man. Full of foul spirits and demons. So, yeah, we are a spiritual war. And, you know, you're walking down the road, you get on a bus, someone might start some shit with you. <laughs> it's a demon on them that's making them do that. You know, it's... So you at spiritual war 24-7. Let me read this again. 2 Timothy 2, verse 4. No man at war if entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. So we're supposed to be striving for our crown. And in order to get our crown, we have to go go along this difficult path, the path that few are willing to tread. Let's talk about this. You've got someone who's heard this truth, but yet they don't want to do anything with it. For example, they don't want to go out on the street or go up to the camp because they don't want to be seen by, oh, what, what if my mum saw me out there with these guys in these red garments? What would they think? Or what if um my girlfriend saw me? Or what if my boss, my job... My boss from my job saw me, I might lose my job. I don't want to be seen to be associating with these guys. I'll just uh, know this truth and I'm not going to do anything with it. Well, you can't do that because to him, to whom much is given, much is required. If you've heard this truth and you understand it, you should see that as a blessing because it might mean that you might be one of the Lord's hopeful elect if you're an Israelite. But to be honest, you have to be an Israelite to understand this thing anyway. But, you know, being an Israelite, knowing that you're an Israelite is only the first step. It's the first step along this, this difficult path of being in the truth. You know, if you're hearing this word and you believe in it, it would behoove you to go to a camp and start listening and, and be diligent. Don't just go one day and think, oh yeah, I went one day and that's that. No, be consistent. You know, you should be out, brothers out there 
week in week out you know i can't think of the last week when n none of none of the brothers in my camp went out i can't think of it if we weren't able to go out on one day on a saturday we'd be out on a sunday and that's very rare that that ever happens you know we're all very diligent in making sh in doing our best to make our calling and our election sure and i'm just speak i could just speak of my camp but this is even broader all the men in the G all all of the men in the gms I should say all the camps in GMS are diligent. Otherwise they wouldn't be in GMS because GMS is the most diligent uh, camp out there, starting with our elders and apostles. You know, they've been out there for over 30 years doing this work, not fainting, not taking breaks in the summer or hiding at home in the winter. They're diligent. You know, the, the scriptures say, present your body as a living sacrifice. Be diligent. Be instant, in season and out of season. Let me get these precepts. Rather than just quoting them. Second Timothy 4 and verse 2. Close to where I was. It says... I'm going to start from verse 1. I charge thee therefore before the Most High... And the Lord Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his, and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. See, we're supposed to be instant, in season and out of season. There's no, oh, I'm going to take two, I'm going to take a sabbatical. I'm going to take a two-week holiday. Well, okay, brothers might go on holiday for two weeks, but really, if you're on holiday, you still should be meditating on this truth. You know what I mean? Me personally, it's very rare that I ever leave my house without my scriptures because there've been there's been situations where I've been caught caught up, and I'm like, oh damn, I don't have my Bible with me, man, and I'm in a situation where it'd be very beneficial that I did have it. So therefore, nine times out of ten. I try to make sure that whenever I've got my bag, my sword is always in it. Because you never know. Let me put it this way. And this is a good practice, actually. It's a very good practice because you might leave your house one day thinking, you know what, man? I'm just going out to work and I'll be home at 6 p.m. or whatever. But you don't know what can happen in a day. Because man's going to of the Lord, right? So let's say you go out, you, you go to work or whatever, but something happens on your way home. And you end up getting arrested through no fault of your own. I don't know if they let you have your Bible in your prison, in, in a prison cell. But hey, if they did let you have a Bible, it would be good to have it. Or, you you know, you might get stranded somewhere. Your car might break, break down on the motorway. And you're stuck there for a few hours waiting for uh, the uh, repair, the AA or whatever to come and fix your car. Let's say your battery in your phone goes and you can't read really, you can't read your scriptures on your phone. Well, it'd be great if you had your Bible with you because then you could you could have the word with you. And these words are comfort. Because look, man, in this life it's gonna be rocky and uneven and you know there's gonna be pitfalls and all kinds of stuff. But our comfort is these scriptures. And I can't say that earnestly enough or sincerely enough because in the in the path I've been on. And the adversities that I've gone through in my own personal walk, these scriptures have been my parachute through all of this hell. And now that I have the knowledge, wisdom and understanding of the scriptures, it has given me peace of mind. Because let me put it this way. When I was in the world and I was a young boy, teenager, young man, um, I always felt like, I always felt like something was wrong. And my like something just didn't compute. Let me put it this way. It's like you look at a sum in maths. You look at four and four and you know that it's the answer to four plus four is eight. But the whole world is telling you, no, 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 four plus four is seven. But in your mind, it just doesn't sit, sit in your spirit. You know, no, nah, man, no, nah, man, four plus four ain't seven. It ain't seven. It ain't seven. You know, in your spirit, it just ain't right. And then eventually you find the Bible and the Bible says four plus four equals eight. And then you realise that the whole world was wrong and that the scriptures were right. And then your mind finds ease because then things start to make sense. 
you start to understand why there's wickedness in the world. You understand why you're in the in the position that you're in. You understand why your history has been stolen from you. You understand why all the relationships you were in with women always ended up uh, ending up adversely or going south. You understand why you never really vibed with your friends in the world and that you didn't really have the same spirit as them. You understand that you, why you wanted righteousness in a wicked world. You understand who your enemies are, these other nations, predominantly the nation of Esau. You understand why your ancestors were led in sl into slavery. You understand why Yahushua had to die on the cross. And you understand why his blood ne was needed for the, for the salvation of Israel. And then you understand, okay, that's why they crucified the Lord. Because here's another one. When I was a child and I used to go to church and Sunday school, they always talked about the, the boring aspects of the scriptures. Now I'm older, nothing, nothing, no aspect of the scripture is boring to me because I understand the breakdowns. But back in the day, when I was young, they wasn't talking about um, King David and his mighty men. They weren't talking about flipping um, Samson busting heads and um, with a jawbone of an ass. They weren't talking about that stuff. All they talk about is, oh, the animals went in two by two into the ark. Yeah, they talked about the flood, but they didn't talk about why the flood happened. They didn't talk about, okay, so four people survived the flood and from those four people we get all nations that are on the earth this day. They never talked about that stuff. They talked about the miracles that Yahushai did. For example, healing the blind and the lepers and cleansing the lepers and healing the sick. But they never talked about why Yahushai did that and who he did that to. They just made it out that, oh, he loves everybody and everybody can be saved. They didn't tell you that Yahushua was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They didn't tell you that salvation was only for the elect of Israel. They didn't tell us that, you know, the saints will be joyful on their bed and, and singing the praises of the Most High with a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance. You know, they didn't tell you about that. Psalms 149. Let me get that quickly. Yeah, they didn't say this in Sunday school. Praise ye Yahweh. Sing unto Yahweh a new song and his praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let, the, let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing the praises unto him with the timbrel and with the harp. For Yahweh taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory and let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of the Most High be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their king with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, This honour have all his saints, praise ye Yahweh. They never read these scriptures in Sunday school when I was a child. Therefore, when they used to talk about how Jesus being crucified, I always asked myself, well, hang on a minute. If this man was loved everybody and he was going around and healing everybody and, you know, he did nothing wrong, why did they crucify him? Why did they crucify him? You see, it just didn't, just, just didn't add up when I was in Christianity as a child going to Sunday school. And I could discern, I could read the spirits of the people because, you know, that's one aspect that I've been blessed with, the, the ability to read people's spirits. I could tell that there was no wisdom in these in these um, these churches and, and the Sunday school teachers. They had no wisdom. So therefore, I always wondered, you know, why, why, why? Surely there's got to be more to it than that. And as I said, when you come into this truth, you start to understand why. Yeah, how I was crucified because you understand no man perished being innocent. You know, that's just one aspect of it. And secondly, you have to understand that, you know, when Abraham offered up Isaac, that was your Hawashai. Isaac was your Hawashai who under understanding the incarnation. So therefore, he didn't have to Abraham didn't sacrifice his child in that go around, but ultimately the child would be sacrificed in Yahushai's when he came back as himself as Yahweh Shai. 
So there's a lot of deep things with the scripture that make sense when you come to this knowledge, wisdom and understanding of this truth. And when you understand things, it makes sense. Because I've always said that fear comes from an element of uncertainty. Like if you look at a child, most children are afraid of the dark. Why are they afraid of the dark? Well, because there's uncertainty. They don't know what's lurking under their bed in the dark. You know, and quite rightfully so, because, you know, in these children's bedrooms, as I said, just like when children are at school, there's demons in the school, there's demons in your children's bedroom. There's, de there's demons all around your house. You know, obviously, that's why you fast and you pray and you, you try and get these demons out. And this is like, again, another aspect that came out at camp last week, something that I'd said before. Be careful about inviting various people into your home. Because the deceitful man have many trains, yeah? So when these people come into your home, they're bringing demons in with them. And do you think those demons are going to get up and leave when they leave? <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. If, if, you're, if you're, you know, strong in the faith, you're prayed up, you're, you know, strong in the spirit, then demons don't want to be around you. But, but, you never know what demon may hop off someone and start lodging in your home just because you invited this person into your home one time. That's why you need to, you know, it's like battlefield, man. In a battlefield situation, you don't let everybody up into your camp, man. Let me get that one about deceitful man have many trains. Because it's very true. And I'm grateful because I was brought up in a way where I was taught to be um, vigilant about who I keep company with. Yeah, here we are. Sirach 11 and 29. This is Sirach, the 11th chapter and the 29th verse. Bring not every man into thine house, for the deceitful man hath many trains. We read that again, Sirach 11, 29. Bring not every man into thine house, for the deceitful man hath many trains. Guess what? Those train carriages are filled with demons. Just like you see a long train with like about 8 carriages or 10 carriages, men have trains too. And those trains contain demons. And those demons, if you associate with them, they can start rubbing off on you. Or adversely affecting your life. For all, of, all of a sudden, you might start having really bad luck. And you're wondering, why the hell is this happening? Maybe it's because of the company you're keeping. Think about that. You know, the, the scriptures say the angel of the Lord encampeth around, around about them that fear him. So if you're associating with men righteous men in this truth then lord willing those angels will be encamping encamping around you too lord willing but let me go back to the main topic of this lesson about being on this difficult road road yes this road is indeed difficult but the script i'm looking at this this stony uneven path and the scriptures did say that the most i will give his angels charge over thee Lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Let me get that. Bear with me, I just find it. Here we go. Psalms 91 and 12, beautiful precept. And that happened to me today when I was walking across that, that path, this, this uneven path. I did end up dashing my foot against a stone, but guess what? The most high's angels gave charge over me that I didn't, that I didn't trip. I just kicked the stone. I didn't, I didn't trip. Let me get it here. It says, Yes. Only, let me read up, man. There's some good stuff. I'm going to read it all, man. Psalms 91 and 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
I will say of Yahweh, he is my refuge and my fortress, my power, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings thou sh shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid by the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by the day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy right side, sorry, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made Yahweh, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. See, that's what I was talking about right here. You're walking across this dangerous path, but Yahweh is going to give his angels charge over ye, over ye, lest that, yes, lest ye dash your foot against the stone, because you're walking over this dangerous path. But Yahweh has got your back. If you're doing this in in faith and truth and in sincerity, yeah, the Lord's going to put things, adverse situations on your path to try you, but you're going to overcome. You're going to overcome through the spirit and will of Yahweh by Hashem Yahweh it says, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, see those dangerous things. The young, lad, the young lion and the dragon thou shalt trample under feet, see, will overcome all these adversities. Because he hath set his love upon me, Therefore I will del deliver him. I will set him on high because he have known my name. Man, that's a cold cut to you, I see, I see, you, I see, I Cold cut to you, I see, I oh, Damn, slow down. That's a cold cut to you, I, you, I see. Yeah, I, you, I see members who don't think that the name of the Lord is important. The name of the Lord is, the, is, is, is one of the pillars of this thing. It's, it's the key. The name's Yahweh and Yahweh Shai. Otherwise, who are you praying to? You know, who are you putting your faith in? It says, He shall call upon me and I will answer him. And I can attest to that. You know, just recently, man, there have been some prayers I've been making. I'm like, whoa. I'm being shocked by I'm seeing these prayers being answered super quickly. And just things that I wouldn't have imagined. And I, I only... I have a hundred percent faith that it is the will of Yahweh that these prayers are being answered because there's no way certain things that would be happening otherwise. It's like I'm asking, asking Lord, please show me a sign in this situation, and He sends me a sign almost the next day. It's happened more times than I can count recently, and you know what? That makes me feel scared and it makes me feel humbled because I'm like, whoa, the, my prayers are actually reaching the ears of of the Most High. Obviously, when you pray, your prayers are being carried up unto Yahweh Shai. And Yahweh Shai uh, talks about it with his father like he's making um, intercession on our behalf because we can't go directly to Yahweh. We can't go directly to Yahweh. We have to go through the mediator. So the fact that when you're making these prayers and you're seeing the prayers answers, it means that, you know what, man? Maybe your ways are pleasing the Most High. So there you go. It's a very humbling and humbling thing to think that, well, you've got a... Um, you, you've got a power in the heavens who's hearing your humble supplications. You know? Humble prayers. It says, um, He shall call upon me and I will answer him. Verse 15. And I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him and shew him my salvation. And that's what we're working for, man. A salvation to be worthy of it. So, when it comes to adversity, man, don't throw, don't throw your toys out of the pram and be like, oh, why is this happening to me? No. Every situation 
is set up for a reason. There's nothing by coincidence. There's nothing by chance. And it's all designed to show you what manner of man you are and to build your character. Because if you run away from adversity, you're never going to build your character. You know, you're always going to stay on the same level. But through enduring, that's how we grow. And uh, I'm going to get one more precept. We need to. We don't just. Need, we don't just need to endure. We need to overcome. Revelation two and twenty five. To him that overcometh. Yeah. But this is how I speak, and he says, "But that which ye have already hold fast till I come." And to he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Read that again. And he that overcometh, see, overcoming the difficulties, man. Not just walking down in smooth, easy, smooth, easy roads, you know. It's not going to be easy in this truth. Your family's going to come against you. Your, your, your boss and your job, you know, your friends, everybody's going to come against you. But you've got to ste be steadfast in this truth and rooted. You've got to overcome. And it says, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So yeah, I hope that's been a little edifying lesson, man. Endure. Endure, man. We're almost at the end now anyway, just to just keep on enduring. So with that, giving all praises, all and glory unto Yahweh. Bar Hashem Yahweh Shai, Bar Hashem Makakudash. Double honours to the elders and apostles, great most done it all well. Shalom to you, Akim, teaching this word with faith and truth. And until the next one, I say Shalom. Wa Ababa Bo, Wa Kwame Shalom.